This fall, state cannabis regulators came out with a report on their first three years of operations, outlining their work to license different links in the retail marijuana chain and highlighting progress in other areas, including medical marijuana and cannabinoid hemp businesses. The review comes a few months after the Hochul administration undertook an internal review of the operations of the Office of Cannabis Management, which led to the ouster of the nascent agency's first executive director. To discuss the new report, as well as the operations of the state cannabis regulator more broadly, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Felicia Reed, Executive Deputy Director and Acting Executive Director of the State Office of Cannabis Management. Welcome back to the show, Felicia. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we'll get to the progress report specifically, but first, as I mentioned in the introduction, the review of the Office of Cannabis Management's operations uh, was initiated this spring in large part due to a backlog of retail applications submitted in the fall of 2023. Where do things stand with those applications now? So we have two queues. One is a December queue and one is a November. As for the November queue, that's the one we're working through now. And we've committed to, as an agency, reviewing that entire queue. That queue has got several thousand uh, applications in it. But as we've put in process and put in place our single point of contact system, which you might remember uh, being called out in the uh, OGS assessment, we've really moved through all applications fairly quickly and getting eyes at least on all of them. We're still in the process of going through them in terms of, does everyone have their stuff in? Is every application okay? You know, what still needs to be fulfilled by the applicant? But we are making significant progress through the November queue. And I'm, we're hopeful that I think by the first quarter of next year, we'll be solidly through and concluded on that queue and then can start to think and talk about the December queue. So the December queue is queued up. They're, they're, they're waiting to, to be tackled. <laughs> they're waiting to be tackled, yes. Gotcha. And in the interim, are you taking additional applications for other elements of the marijuana marketplace, or is that waiting too? That's also waiting. So the, the application windows are closed until we can get through and fi- we get through November until we figure out what we're going to do with and how we're going to approach December. Uh, I have heard, you know, from various places, people are, are pointedly interested in different types of licenses um, that, that miss the two cues. So we know, and I know, that there is a significant interest out there in becoming part of this market, but, you know, the window has not opened up, up again yet. So generally speaking, then, do you have a sense of how many retail licenses have been issued in total for New York or about how many businesses are actually open as we speak on October 21st? So I know as of the the report, there were around 150 adult use retailers. I think at this point, we recently celebrated our 200th about three weeks ago. And I think we're up in like the two tens now for retail establishments. Uh, In terms of the breadth of the queue, I couldn't tell you offhand exactly how many there are in that, but there are always more retail applications as we've seen in the queues. There are always more applications for retail than there are any other business type. It's my understanding that at this point, cannabis regulators have granted a handful of medical dispensaries licenses to operate uh, retail dispensaries. Can you explain the process for determining how many of these type of operations will be allowed to enter the retail space, which is currently dominated just in terms of the number of licenses by these smaller operations? Mm -hmm. So we just uh, approved three new ROs and part of the RO expansion. There are more in the pipeline for consideration. And ROs is a short. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes, I do that thing. Registered organization. Registered organization. These are also, in some cases, multi-state operators who have businesses or um, who have operations across the country. Some are much more local to New York. Um, but one of the things that we were thinking about in doing the uh, registered organization expansion is a very pointed focus on patient care and access. What we've seen and what every jurisdiction sees as uh, we, they open adult use, there is a decrease or a fall off in the medical side. And so what we want to make sure of is that patients who have legitimate medical needs for medical cannabis have the opportunity to access those stores. And we don't want to be in a situation where all of our medical providers are closing. You know, I had a recent conversation where I was point blank asked, you know, is the medical market important to New York? And I was like, yes, because of the patient care 
perspective. We don't want to lose momentum or opportunity there. And in fact, we also just had a conference in Buffalo around uh, cannabinoids and clinical practice, which really underscored the important, the important work being done in the medical side, but also the real need for patients to, ha- to continue to have access. Yeah, that idea of meaningful access to medical marijuana has been something that's dogged this initiative since it was uh, legalized about a decade ago. So where do you think that effort stands right now? And what do you think needs to be done, if anything, to make medical marijuana more accessible? So one is ensuring that, you know, there are places open and available for folks to go to, you know, for better or worse. And I think in most cases better, we have a very large state. So let's say we were Rhode Island, the volume that we would have might be sufficed for Long Island, not Long Island, Rhode Island, excuse me. But um, for New York State, we're talking in a massive, a massive geography and people all over. And so when one medical provider closes, there's a pointed lack of access for folks in that community and the community writ large. So one of the things that we have to think about is, A, how do we think about keeping medical providers open? Um, How do we think about ensuring that we are coming up with novel and creative ways for medical patients to be able to access medical marijuana? So we're currently thinking about and talking, especially going into the next legislative session, what can we be doing um, and thinking about with with the medical side of cannabis on what can be most supportive of patients in that market? What additional legislative authority do you need? Uh, In terms of some other opportunities, like if we're thinking about accessibility and especially the cost of medical marijuana, there are certain things that we would have to think about in terms of coverage, in insurance coverage, in terms of just expanded abilities and easier abilities to keep the price of medical marijuana down or at least accessible to patients, but also making sure that that product is available as widely as it can be. Uh, On the insurance front, are we talking about, say, a mandate uh, to cover medical marijuana products, or is it something else? I'm never going to be someone who's like, yes, this do mandates. I think we have to think very intentionally because, again, it's still Schedule 1 at the federal level, right? And so there are all of these places where federal and state initiatives intersect, and we want to make sure that we're not moving in a way that causes issues for the market or for patients. So I wouldn't, I'm not going to say a mandate on the insurance, but what I am saying is – thinking creatively about what we can do as a state um, and the extent to which that there needs to be legislation involved to make that happen, we're open to every opportunity and alternative. Coming back to the retail side of this equation, do you have a projection for the number of legal retailers that make sense for New York in a mature marijuana marketplace? I've heard the number 2,000, but again, very big state, very diverse population needs and concentrations. So I know that our policy and analytics team is constantly thinking and looking at what is happening in the market, what's happening in sales, what they're hearing from communities in terms of needs or whatever else might support the market. What we don't want to do is pull any lever too hard and then end up with a really untenable and unsustainable situation. What's interesting about what we have right now is we have this market, we have this industry that has a lot of controls in it. And because it has a lot of controls in it, we have to think very pointedly before we pull any single one or do something in furtherance of a single initiative if it might make challenges somewhere else in the market. So I think as we're looking and we're hearing, I think, you know, that 2000 number is about what we're, what I've heard. But again, as things change over time, which they always will, that number may go up, that may go down. I'm not sure. But I think what we always want to do is be responsive. Well, as legal retailers have opened their doors, in many cases, they've had to compete with illegal operations. But Mm -hmm. your report notes that uh, 67 percent of New Yorkers who consumed uh, cannabis in the past year reported buying from a legal dispensary in 2023. Mm -hmm. So what's your sense of that balance right now? For example, are more sales happening in the legal or illegal market? 
I couldn't give you an accounting of sales in the, in the illegal. I think what we are seeing generally in legal sales is an increase, especially over the past few months, um, at least since I started and a little bit before in uh, late spring, early summer. We just keep seeing sales increase and increase at particular locations and locations across the board, mm-hmm. which leads me to believe, and again, this is my belief, it's not necessarily truth. This is what I believe. There's been a lot of conversation in the public around some of the dangers of what illicit operators might be selling. I think people can quibble and people can argue over the extent of regulation or the fact of regulation. But one of the things that I know is most important is that in the way that we regulate and look at our market, we want to make sure we're providing a safe, a clean, a highly tested product. And that is not guaranteed on the illicit market. And I think consumers care a lot about the things that they consume, right? You know, where is it coming from? Is it safe? Is it, what is it? You know, and having the reliability that comes from purchasing from a licensed operator, that's a really big value add for consumers. So as we're seeing numbers tick up, I think it's a couple of things happening. One, the widening availability of the retail market. And two, of course, as that intersects with enforcement efforts, both across the state and New York City. And on that health front, your report notes that four of five adverse health events reported uh, involve products not regulated by the Office of Cannabis Management, although mm-hmm. in total, I think there were 164 adverse health events, which is probably a relatively small number when we think about mm-hmm. how many people are actually consuming marijuana. Sure. I want to come back, though, to that 67% number of people who reported buying from uh, you know a legal dispensary. There's one way to view that is that 67% have now moved exclusively to the legal market, but there are, I imagine, some people who are purchasing from the illegal market as well. Maybe they like to get flour from the illegal market and uh, other products from the legal market. So how do you think about that 67% uh, number? That's a good question. I think... I never like to read more deeply than what a number puts forward. So that's 67%. I don't know if that's exclusively from the legal market or it's some combination of um, buying from the illicit and the legal market or buying from a home. I'm not sure what that number might consist of. However, I think insofar that it's significant that sort of lends a degree of consumer faith in the licit market and in the products that are available. I think one of the things I think about around consumers is, you know, right now to buy cannabis at a dispensary is not a break the bank situation for some. It is for others. Right now, cannabis can be can be considered in some cases a luxury product, and so I think what's what's what in thinking about consumers and thinking about economic realities, you know, one of the things I talk about with the team often is when we're talking about the products that this market puts forward. Are we talking about a range? Are we talking about things that are affordable? Are we talking about things that people find that can meet their needs? And I think we have a lot of things to look at when we're thinking about how and why people are purchasing from the regulated market and how and why people are purchasing from the illicit market. One of the things I often think about is this word tension. That is, consumers have New Yorkers have a lot of things going on, no matter where they are. And the more you make someone work to get something they want, it's going to lead to a thought, perhaps, that they might go somewhere else. And perhaps some of that somewhere else is the illicit market. So one of the things I always want to think about is, are we reducing tension for consumers? Are the products that we want folks to engage in universally or widely available such that it's not a deliberation that ends in going to the illicit market. Because I one of the things I often say too is the illicit market is so in so many ways older than all of us in this room. It has been around forever. It is adaptive, it is creative, it has found ways to survive and it's going to continue to try to do that. The thing we have to think about as a as a regulatory agency and an agency that's meant to serve consumers is 
thinking about things in a way that requires us in some cases to put on a different cap and say, well, what is the need that the illicit market is providing here and what can we do to, prov- to supplant that, that need? It's a bit of a long conversation, a long deliberation, but I think it requires the agency and the office to, like I said before, be responsive to what it's seeing on the ground and not just say, we want things a certain way, it's got to be that way, if it's not that way, you know, it's not gonna work, we have to be incredibly creative. We've heard from licensed cannabinoid retailers that uh, some enforcement actions, which are billed as targeting unlicensed marijuana sales, have inappropriately caught up some of these legal businesses in their net. How do you respond to this critique, particularly the idea that law enforcement hasn't cared to differentiate between products that might, to the untrained eye, uh, seem like marijuana products, but are actually you know, below the THC threshold to qualify? We've seen an issue in the office where folks who have hemp licenses are selling product that should be regulated by OCM, but is not. Is uh, that because it has a certain level of THC in it? That, yeah, it okay. can be. So I think one, one of the interesting things in this industry is people are always going to get creative. And so what we're seeing as technology and extraction and different ways of processing cannabis expand and become, to use a word again, creative, we're going to see folks that have opportunities in one area sort of manipulate that into something that can be an intoxicant. And so one One of the things that that we have a very pointed eye and mind on is, you know, if someone has a hemp license and they are selling, you know, a hemp product, you know, as they always have been and as they should be, that is not an issue. Where it becomes an issue is when we have certain folks who are figuring out ways to make products that do have intoxicating effects. And again, we're still learning as everybody, the community, the nation, about around what cannabis is. Yes, you can understand it from a molecular level, but in terms of how it engages and interacts with the body and different bodies, that is something we always want to pay attention to. And insofar as there is the ability to synthesize cannabis products in a way that pushes things over the threshold or that makes products or makes substances that can be intoxicating, that is something that we want to keep an eye on and make sure that there is good structure and good rules around and a good understanding of those products. Do you feel like the boots on the ground, so to speak, who are responsible in many cases for trying to differentiate between what's on shelves and what shouldn't be on shelves, understand all the nuance in the answer you just gave? I can speak for our folks at the state level enforcement investigation. So there's a there's a difference and a and a and a bit of a split between what uh, enforcement actions are taken by the office and what enforcement actions might be taken by a municipality, let's say New York City. Mm -hmm. Those are two different cohorts, although the mission, the overall mission, is generally the same. When I talk about uh, enforcement from uh, the state, that is OCM, I can tell you that those that enforcement crew is highly trained rigorously trained on how to not just engage with the community, but also engage with the products. Um, I've learned so much from those folks in terms of what they're seeing, and they see new shifts and avenues in the illicit market quicker than anybody else because they're out there, boots on the ground, in stores, in communities, talking to folks. And so when I think about our, our state enforcement, you know, I know it is very considered, very targeted, and... Um, does a very thorough and in-depth review before it's going into a location. And that's the kind of thing we'd like to see from any municipality that has the ability to do cannabis enforcement. Well, according to the report, there were 1,341 enforcement inspections that have been conducted across New York State. Are the bulk of those done by the state? inspectors or does the bulk of that fall to 
the local law enforcement? So when it comes to state action, we do that in conjunction with state, sometimes local law enforcement. Um, and again, I'm going to carve out, you know, New York City here um, because they have their, their own process. But, you know, when it came to the task force and we're still working with um, many different agencies across the state in our enforcement endeavors. So one of the things that I, I, I've talked about with our enforcement team is, you know, we've got to be in, as engaged with the community as as we can. And so connecting with local law enforcement, connecting with local legislators, making sure that those relationships are sound and sound and there's good communication between us uh, is incredibly important to um, addressing some of these stores and also trying to get a sense of what's on the horizon or what's coming as the enforcement work expands. So the state has a so-called social equity fund, which is supposed to help the first wave of marijuana retailers get off the ground, like if they need access to financing. This has been a well-documented rocky rollout, but some dispensaries have been launched with the help of this financing or have received help finding a location. When you think about the breadth and scope of this fund, which is supposed to be responsible for doling out $200 million, do you think it's been a success so far or have there been missed opportunities? Right now, um, we are, interesting enough, timely, you know, we're still gathering data around the performance of some of those locations because we want to make sure, you know, as an agency, we hear a lot of things. We hear from the public, we hear from legislators, we hear from other state offices. And one of the things that we want to be sure of, and, and I've said this in other places that I'm particularly mindful of evidence, is ensure that what is actually happening um, guides what we do next. And so when it comes to uh, the DASNY fund, I do know that some stores are active, are open. I know that others have faced complications. And so I think for us, it's a matter of getting all the data around those locations and then figuring out what we need to do next with the folks who are participating in that fund. But I want to make sure that it is responsive to what has actually happened and not, you know, based on uh, speculation regulation, hyperbole, or supposition, because if we get to something like that, that's going to be really difficult to figure out what those next steps are going to be. Well, it sounds like, based on that answer, that you're not, at this point, ready to call for an overhaul of the Social Equity Fund and its operations. But is there a timeline that you're looking at for evaluating the fund and whether there need to be changes? Not strictly, but what I would say is, because it's, it's a routine topic of conversation at the agency is I'm hoping in the next several weeks to be able to figure out, you know, what those next moves are. I want to turn to personnel, which was a major focus of this internal review, or at least the number of personnel. What's the state of the hiring at the Office of Cannabis Management right now? Any meaningful updates you can share? When I got on, there were around 180. I think to, as of today, there are 210 across the agency. So we've done a lot of work bringing folks in both at the executive level, but also on the programmatic and operations level. So our licensing staff, our enforcement staff, our hearing officers, because hearing our hearings are, are a large part of our practice, our folks in compliance who are going out to the different licensees. Again, large state, a lot of, lot of stuff to cover. Looking at our numbers, at least through the end of the year, we're hopeful that by the end of the year, we'll have gotten at least around 250. I mean, I know the agency overall, in terms of the scope of its work, needs to be much, much bigger than 250. But I think what I care most about is the progress we're making right now. And that is not just bringing people in, but making sure they don't turn around and leave. So I'm really glad that in the last couple of months, you know, we saw some folks leaving in June, July, but people seem to come and likes and want to and like staying. I think a lot of the office 
work around that has been really around engagement. You know, I and the senior team have sat down at town halls with every single office and I am, and I think my staff will tell you, widely and readily available for, you know, folks to just walk in the office or have a conversation or follow up on a thought. And I think things are different in that and in a way that's good for the agency where people feel like they can be heard, they can raise an idea, they're not cabined or excluded from conversation, even if it's at the executive level. And I like that. You know, I like running a much flatter organization where people feel like they're part of a community. I won't be all touchy feely and say family, but feel like they're part of a community that's actually working toward the same thing. I don't think that existed before. So I think that element is really contributing to an overall better culture at the agency and one where people want to stay. Well, sticking with uh, personnel, a former assembly member, Tremaine Wright, was tapped to chair the Cannabis Control Board back in 2021. I believe her first term either expires or expired this fall. Has she been reappointed? That would happen upon session. So right now, I think I think a much of our board might be in holdover status, I believe. Okay. And then sticking with personnel, when you and I talked in July, you said you hadn't thought about whether you wanted to be appointed executive director for a full term now that you've had three months, uh, maybe some time to, to yourself at, during that uh, window. Do you want the full-time appointment? I knew you were going to ask this, and I told myself you prepared for this question. <laughs> I did put in my hat for consideration very late. <laughs> Very late because I wasn't sure. You know, I think it could be very easy to get caught up in the idea of being the head of a state agency or being the first to do X or the first to do Y or this. But I really wanted to make sure that I was a good fit for the agency before thinking to myself that I could be a good representative of the agency. You know, I've had that conversation with myself and with. Folks all over OCM, I don't just spend a lot of time talking to executives. That's not, you know, my vibe. I talk to everybody. And I think what was helpful is hearing from the team that they hoped that I would apply. So um, I did. And so we'll see what happens. But I'm hopeful. But we'll see. Another thing we talked about this summer was this idea of re-examining some of the existing regulations that were in place from the Office of Cannabis Management and what we talked about at the time had to do with marketing and advertising rules. Are there other areas that you're currently reviewing or want to review? For example, one of the things that we've heard about is whether you know current marijuana farmers should have a larger footprint for their efforts to grow outdoors mm-hmm. or maybe letting them grow indoors. Is that something that's under review? Yeah. So we just got, uh, for the first time ever, I think the agency did uh, uh, submitted departmentals. Um, and so one of the things that I really like about departmentals are, you know, the ability to reflect on the last year or the last several years and see what's working and what isn't. Um, And also going back to hearing from the industry, even in the four months that I've been here, what things were in June 2024 are not what things are in October 2024. And so some of the things that we're hearing at these town halls, at these office hours that I've been doing, that even individuals on the team are hearing back from the community, are making their way into the thinking of the agency in terms of what might need to change. I do not want this agency to become static in its approach, because I think at that point, we will not be serving our our market and serving our community. And so, you know, I, I don't just say it as lip service, you know, all ideas welcome. I think some of the ideas that we have gotten from the community, but also in the way we've seen shifts around the industry, have led to pitched ideas for future legislation, future reg- regulation, just future opportunities. So, so you think potentially things like indoor grow and the outdoor footprint could be 
revisited for mm-hmm. the existing marijuana farmers? Yes, I would say certainly revisited. And I had the real pleasure of going out to meet licensees. Um, usually when I go out with a compliance team, it's interesting. Like you could you could Google me, but people don't. And so I show up and they just think I'm just a regular worker. And I'm like, yes, this is like undercover boss. Um, but one of the things that I, 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 I was at a grower, uh, a cultivator out off the Taconic last week. And it's really interesting to hear their approach to compliance, but also some of the challenges they have. And I'm like, yeah, why don't we do that? Or why don't we allow that? And then taking that back to the office, having a conversation about it, and potentially it's showing up in a proposal that the agency is making to make improvements or expansions in the industry. So all that is to say is things like I'm not saying yes to the two things that you mentioned, but things like that, those are always under consideration by the agency. I'm surprised when people see the pins you're wearing, whether it's New York State or an Office of Cannabis Management, they don't recognize that they've got... Oh, I don't wear a, these. A big, okay, so you... I don't... We, <laughs> there's no wear... There's no wear on a Carhartt that's good to put, like, these two pins. <laughs> like, <laughs> so only when I'm wearing, like like, a blazer or at, like, a... I'm not, not, I'm not wearing my pins and I'm going to go see licensees. <laughs> I am wearing regular stuff. Um, but it's been, re- it's been really great to get out there and to hear from the farmers and the growers, you know, how they got into the business and the why. Hear from retailers who they're partnering us with, with, especially around some folks who take the equity piece incredibly seriously. Um, wh- whether we're talking about, you know, retailers, uh, micro-business processors. It's been so interesting to hear everyone's ideas or programmatic things they're thinking about in order to ensure that how they run their business and what they do with their business and the fruits of their business have this equity component. It's It's been really incredibly refreshing and something that I have not heard anywhere else. Well, finally, a driving force behind the marijuana legalization effort was the criminal justice component based on the idea that the war on drugs has been disproportionately waged against people of color. And to that end, your oh, report... Oh, it's not an idea. The fact, you okay. mean. There you go. <laughs> to, to that end, your report notes that uh, no one in New York is incarcerated anymore just because of a marijuana offense. Mm-hmm. Why is that an important distinction? I think last I was here, we talked a very little bit about the fact that you know, my history is in juvenile justice. And one of the things that I thought about pointedly in taking this job is something I thought about a lot when I was in juvenile justice, which is the legacies of discriminatory political and policy and social decisions were the kids that I had the privilege of working with for years looking at a youth and meeting their family and realizing that some of the things that you get to you you read about academically show up in people today uh, and show up in in young people today and so the thing I think about a lot is how did we get here um, and so when it comes to conviction solely for marijuana offenses and folks who are incarcerated for that, Simultaneously, all those things happened while there were plenty of other people using, distributing, uh, engaging in the business or the market or the ameliorative effects of cannabis. And so I think what we're ultimately talking about is, and although, you know, my mom would always say, if everyone would make God laugh, tell him what's fair, we are talking about fairness. We're talking about fairness, we have the ability to control. And I think thinking about those, the, those convictions and the years of time lost, the umpteenth amount of opportunity lost, and then the things that even when folks, you know, finished their conviction, there were still stigmas, you know, still exclusions, still all of this. You know, for me, the convictions and getting rid of those convictions and the fact that nobody is incarcerated for a marijuana related offense alone is a start. I think there's a lot that we have to do as New Yorkers 
and I say as New Yorkers, I'm not going to say as an agency because I realize that, you know, there's a part for everyone to play in addressing the harms of the past. It's not just for the folks who work for OCM. But I think as New Yorkers, we have a big role to play in what we really mean by justice and what we really mean by opportunity. And so, like I said, I think the criminal convictions and the records are a place to start, but you know, I want to make sure that as an agency, we're not just thinking and doing downstream solutions. There are many, many upstream solutions when it comes to the legacies of the war on drugs, the legacy of disproportionality in criminal justice enforcement. There's a lot of upstream that I think we as New Yorkers, and now I will say us as OCM, can do to address some of those things, to build support, to build resources, to shift the perspective on people who have been harmed and punished. And one of the things I was actually telling my husband the other day is some of the most in incredible, intelligent, capable, insightful people I have ever met have been behind bars. And behind bars, that, that talent and that ability gets wasted. And so, you know, imagine what New York could be, what we as communities could be if the energy and the talent and the drive of those folks was among us. You mentioned resources. Has money from retail sales that's supposed to go towards, say, different equity and, uh, I guess, restorative programs, have that, has that money begun to flow? So we just released, I think it was October 16th, our uh, application for Community Grants Reinvestment Fund. So really excited about that. Um, and so taking some of the the revenues from cannabis and channeling it back into communities, particularly uh, to serve, you know, young people like the, like the, like the kids, sorry, young adults, I'm not supposed to call them kids, young adults that um, I, I served previously. But um, I'm really excited that that is out there so that we can start um, really supporting community organizations that do incredible work. Uh, and one of the things I will say on that is, you know, coming from OCFS, um, I had a, a, a leadership that was always very critical in thinking about where does the money from the state go? You know, does it go to the folks that always get it, that always have the best written proposal, the best written grants, the best, when I know plenty of organizations, particularly community and youth serving organizations that could do so much with money like that. And so when we're talking about the Community Grants Reinvestment Fund, I really want to think critically about where the money is going, addressing some of those upstream aspects. Uh, in addition to downstream, of course, let's not be, I'm not going to be prejudicial, but I, I'm excited to, to think really expansively around, you know, where that money goes and making sure that it is tied to direct action, not speculative, not hopeful, not one day, not maybe when we get to it, but direct action on the ground in real time. I'm really, really jazzed that that's out there and to see what happens with it. Well, we've been speaking with Felicia Reed. She's the Executive Deputy Director and Acting Executive Director of the State Office of Cannabis Management. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And for more Capital Press Room content, visit capitalpressroom.org or wherever you download your favorite podcasts.